I promised that one day I would be coming, and they did. Uh, you have with Michael somebody who is uh, the, the most persistent <laughs> and uh, the most friendly in his persistence. Uh, I don't know how many times he asked me to come, and uh, every time I was bumping on him in uh, a can or whatever, Maurice, you have to come. And they said, okay, one day I will do it. And uh, I'm here. And they have chosen uh, an interesting day, <laughs> which is uh, November 11. Yeah. Uh, November 11, for those who are coming from an uh, uh, old part uh, of the world, is uh, uh, the time of the armistice in uh, the First World uh, War. And I'm um, pleased to be in Germany in that day. Uh, so uh, now all this is part of, of the past. I have a, a lecture. I hate to read. If there is something I have never been able to do correctly, is to read the speech. Uh, so I will try to take you through a task which has been imposed upon me by Michael. He said uh, that I had to speak about pioneering communication on behalf of a pioneer. In fact, <coughs> when I'm thinking about this, there, there are a few pioneers in, uh, in our industry. Not many, but there are a few ones. Uh, Marcel Brussel Blanchet was one, uh, and there has been uh, certainly uh, uh, Fairfax Cone was one. Mm -hmm. uh, Ted Bates. J. Walter Thompson. J. Walter Thompson. There, there was a few who have been uh, creating uh, new ways of thinking, uh, new approaches, uh, uh, new thinking. The reality that, in fact, pioneering is almost a contradiction, a paradox in our world. We are supposed to be at the forefront of everything which is new. We are supposed to have uh, the mavericks, the people who are really uh, uh, young, uh, irreverent, uh, capable of uh, 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 being uh, audacious uh, and um, building uh, new roads and uh, new openings. The reality, when you look at how our business work, uh, is that we are, as we would say in French, conformist. Mm -hmm. We are honestly and if we look at this with uh, sincerity, we are conformist. <coughs> there are some reasons for that. There are some reasons because uh, uh, we are not in uh, a, an industry which has some simple metrics and a scientific approach. We can add some science, and we can add a few metrics, and we can tell the market that, yes, now, because of uh, digital, we have the analytics, the measurement, which is true. I would say which is half true. But the reality is that um, even now, we cannot measure precisely and maybe it's good that we can measure precisely what we are going to do. It's like uh, when a, a writer is writing uh, a book or a director is directing a film. He has not always the recipe for a bestseller. He has not always the, the recipe for making uh, the best uh, 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 movie, and uh, even when you look at uh, Steven Spielberg, there has been some 
great films and they have some are less great. And um, no one has a, a, a recipe for uh, doing uh, something which is uh, uh, absolutely scientific and this campaign will work. So there is, uh, every time that we start a, a new media, we are uh, going through some uh, uh, experience and uh, uh, try and error, failure, and we try again. And uh, we have a few uh, experience in this field. And if we, I don't know what was uh, uh, the radio in the 30s, but clearly I guess that the first uh, radio messages or the first uh, TV spots were probably uh, something that we will look with kind of tenderness today because, we look, oh, this is what uh, our fathers have done. Uh, and uh, uh, compared to what we are doing today, which is almost... Uh, uh, a, a factory uh, where we can do things with uh, a, almost a few precise idea, it is uh, very different. One of the problems that we are facing when we are doing uh, something new is that in fact very often the client is fearing that we are going in territories where he has no idea, he has not a clue of what the return will be. And um, if we look at uh, the current situation in nowadays where there is so many new things, we could think that, yes, this is the time for being again a pioneer. It is the right time. There are so many startups, so many new things that we should be pioneering and creating something new. And in fact, uh, we, we have uh, only one small problem to do the things as we would like to do. When you look at the new world of digital, there is one issue, a small one, a limited one, but uh, interesting, is that uh, we are addressing, uh, exchanging, uh, interacting with people. And it's a shame, but people are people. You cannot predict their reaction. Uh, you cannot tell how people will react to one of your ad, to one of your um, trick, to one of uh, your ideas. And uh, people are analog, they are not digital. And uh, they are, you cannot put this, not yet, I don't know what will be uh, the, the thing in the future. You cannot yet count that the people will react exactly as you wish. The other aspect is that uh, technology today is at the heart of almost everything we do. And technology is a risk. And uh, the people who are risk adverse uh, should uh, maybe stay at home, but uh, the people who are interested in technology should look at technology as a way of being, maybe opening new roads. Uh, and um, when you, you look at what, what happened in the recent years, you see that uh, it's um, uh, clearly the most risky bet for the future and the most interesting one. The most risky because when you look at uh, any company who has picked the wrong technology, they are suffering for years, sometimes decades, 
look at what happened with Sony. They picked the wrong technology and uh, they have been deriving uh, and drifting uh, for years and they are not yet back where they were. They were dominating the world. I don't know. There are some people who are a little bit more than 20 here in that room, I see. Not many, but uh, for the people who are slightly above 20, they maybe remember of uh, something which was called the Walkman. Walkman who has been invented by Sony. And who invented the iPod? Sony should have. And why Sony has not invented the iPod? Because they weren't on the wrong technology path. And maybe also because of one of the most important issues that one can face. I mentioned this during uh, our talk, which is complacency or arrogance. We are the one who have done this, so we don't need to invent something new. And that is uh, when you start thinking like this, it's very hard to be again a pioneer. The other thing that you have to think about is that if you want to be a pioneer, you have to think that uh, technology uh, should uh, help you just to understand where you are putting your feet. But the real, uh, uh, it, it has to be neutral. The real uh, uh, pioneering thing has to come from there, a little bit from here, and a lot from here. So it's really something which is uh, uh, an individual who want absolutely to create something to really, in French we would say défricher, which is to open new roads, to go in areas where nobody else has uh, uh, been able to go. And you have also to fight against uh, all the people who say, okay, we tried it, didn't work. We, we tried something similar, didn't work. And when you look at the history of advertising, which started, by the way, exactly 100 years before I was born. I know that a lot of people believe that I was born in 1842, <laughs> but it's in 1942. And, uh, we, we have to fight also, uh, wh when you look at the history, and we have written a book, I guess I sent you that book, 1842. If I have not, I should. I will. Uh, it, it's uh, a book which uh, uh, makes the events, the cultural events, the historical events with advertising and to show how advertising was... Uh, in tune with uh, the sociological moment of uh, history. And what you find is that uh, good advertising, the one which lasts, the one which is still there in the mind of the people, it's not only because it's fashionable, it's not because it is in the trend, it is because it is in the essence of the sociological moment of uh, that historical time. And when you are at the heart of something which is sociological, then it lasts, even if it is only the memory of the people. But it does last. Michael was thinking about Dim. I can understand that he can think about Dim. Uh, he can, could think about Wonderbar also. This is something which is embedded in the real belief of the man, the Frenchman at least. <laughs> uh, advertising has been always about 
individual talent, individual craftsmanship, uh, something that um, uh, has been uh, just the thinking of one or two individuals, hardly two. Even when the agency is called Young and Rubicum, there is one who is leading the way. When you look at FCB, there was three, uh, but the only thinker was Fairfax Cohn. Uh, it, it, it's always the same. There is one ma DDB. It was all the idea of Bill Bernbach. Uh, BBH is Johnny Garty. Uh, we can think about Bartle. We can think about Bogle, and Bogle is a very good friend. Nigel is fantastic, but the real thinking, the the one who is having this idea of what creativity should be and the black sheep, etc., it's the uh, creative director in that case, Johnny Garty. So, uh, this is something which is uh, uh, to be always reminded. You, 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 you can't have a, a group who is a pioneer. You, you have one individual who can be, and he can have a team following, and he can have a band who will be his band, his gang, who will really create a difference, who will really create something. There is a few things, if you want to do not be seen uh, as uh, 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 somebody who is uh, digging uh, a grave, and uh, if you want to create something which will last, there, there is uh, some reflexes that uh, you need to have. The first thing is obviously to be cautious uh, and to be sure that uh, what you are proposing, what you are building, I is something which uh, uh, we will work or is that if it doesn't, that you don't do harm. So you have to, to fight uh, against uh, the, the risk and to make sure that you are taking as many uh, caution as you can in order to uh, be uh, uh, capable of moving a little bit the needle. The other aspect is that you, you have to fight skepticism. And uh, I will share with you an interesting story. And this was in uh, 83, 1983. This was last century, so a long time ago. Many of you were not born. Uh, in 1983, uh, I visited a, a, an exhibition, and I found something which I found fantastic, which was an electronic palette. Quantal. And with this quantal palette, you could change the color, you could change the shape, you could change a lot of things. It was the ancestor of what we know today. And I said, this could be fantastic. It could help uh, the creative people. We will avoid to have uh, some uh, uh, layout, some roughs. We can do that pretty quickly. We will speed up the process. We will bring to client a lot of different uh, ways of looking at the same ideas. And I bought one in uh, uh, this San Francisco Fair exhibition. And um, uh, I hired someone who has been trained uh, during uh, two months uh, at Quantel uh, in uh, the area of San Francisco. And uh, we put it in a room. And in those days, it was quite big. And we had to put air conditioning, like a computer. And uh, during almost a year, I put it in the center of the creative department. So, make room. That's the center. So no one can escape. Everyone who is going to the coffee or uh, grabbing uh, something or moving around had to go through that. Rien. 
nothing. No one creative uh, director, assistant, executive, whatever, call him as, or call her as you like, entered in that room and looked at what this uh, palette could do. One day, one of these creative directors had a problem with a client. And the client said, I hate your ad as it is. I love the idea. I want to see new pictures, format, idea, with the same idea, different tomorrow. Timidly, he knocked at the door. Is this my problem? Can you help? And the guy was so happy that he worked all the night. And in the morning, the client, with the creative director, with the team, they found a collection of possibility. Everything that you do today, like this. And it was the beginning, and they saw that this uh, machine is uh, just a machine, just helping, and not doing any harm, not biting the end, not, not hurting, and uh, it has been the beginning of uh, an acceleration and the help to the creative people. Another thing that we, we uh, which illustrates the paradox uh, I was mentioning, which is quite interesting, when you you see a new media who is coming to you, and uh, all the media people, if there is any media people in the room, know that story very well. Any new media comes to the agency, say, I have a great media, this is fantastic, this is what it will be, we will uh, address this kind of audience, we will have this, etc. And uh, normally, the first issue, there is uh, a lot of ads, because first they are offered, and second, the client are happy to be there. And then the magazine comes and say, OK, first issue has been uh, relatively successful. The second, would you play some ads? Ah, I'd rather prefer to wait for the number six or seven, because I'm not sure that you will be still there at the number six or seven. And obviously, if we are not placing ads, there is very little chance that it will be there at the six or sevens. And that is something that I have seen I don't know how many times. So we are supposed to take a risk. We are supposed to help our client to go in new areas, in new domains. And when we have the possibility of going there, say, hey, you know, when I'm placing my ad uh, in uh, uh, Der Spiegel, or L'Express, or on TV, I know that uh, I, I will get that kind of result. In, in this new magazine, I'm not sure, so I prefer to wait. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to, to mention this uh, is interesting as uh, uh, it's something that we have all experienced which is the internet bubble. Internet bubble, you, uh, I think that advertising people, we should look at how we were in a previous life. And I'm asking myself if, if in a previous life we were not sheep. Because uh, in the internet bubble, at the dot-com era, we were all rushing immediately to put maximum ad on all this new thing. The bubble burst, wow, same move. We were rushing back and we abandoned the territory without looking what was working, what was not working. And we are supposed to be the avant-garde. And that's the reason why I'm saying that being a pioneer is not something that we see very often. I had personally the fortune of working uh, with Marcel Bustin-Blanchet. He was a true pioneer. 
Not only he was fascinated by the newness, everything which was new and innovation is something which he found interesting. And as he said several times, he said, I tried a lot, I failed, I don't know how many times, but I had a few successes, and these few successes have been enough for my whole success life. And uh, uh, if there is uh, one big, big thing that he taught me, it's uh, to be curious. To be curious about uh, everything. To observe and to be curious and accept with that curiosity uh, the unusual aspect. For example, one thing which has probably made <coughs> publicists uh, successful uh, at the time uh, when I led the agency was part of uh, this uh, curiosity. Publicis is what? At the origin, a French agency. France, great country, historically. Today, less great. But, but less great, but a country which represented at its best 3% of the worldwide advertising market. Big 3%, but 3%. A country where there was a handful of international advertisers. When Marcel Blustein Blanchet opened his agency in 1926, the same year, McCann Erickson opened in Paris, and J. Walt Thompson opened in Paris. In Paris. They were already international. And he was opening his agency above a charcuterie. Mm -hmm. Delicatessen. With a smell at the office. Uh, and he decided that uh, what he will do is creativity. That will be the mark that will change from what was the advertising in those days. At the time where I took uh, the responsibility, the French agency was still dominating our operations. We had a few uh, uh, agencies outside France, only in Europe and a small, tiny agency in the US. We had 60% uh, of our revenue coming from France, and uh, we were number 16 or 15 on a worldwide basis. In those days, what people were thinking is that globalization was coming, and global campaign should be about uh, homogenization. The same global campaign everywhere. Leo Burnett was doing great global campaigns. I had not the global clients. I had not the global network. What I did is to look at the people, these analog individuals, and I found something which is uh, rather interesting. They are different, including in that room. They are different physically. They are different mentally. They are different in terms of culture. They are different in terms of <coughs> habits. They are different in the food they eat. They are different in almost everything. We tend to believe that mankind is the same. No, very different. And I thought, instead of trying to sell a, an homogenized model born in America, and this has nothing to do with uh, French thinking that America is not good, 
I love America. I have uh, been studying there, etc. So I feel good about America. I thought that the most important thing is that we value the difference, the cultural differences. And this is what has led me to create the concept of Viva la Différence. And um, I have plenty of examples where taking another route, I don't believe that I am a pioneer, so I, I'm very pretentious, very arrogant, but not to the degree of considering that I'm a pioneer. I, I'm from the second generation of pioneers, so a builder, but not a pioneer. I have not opened any interesting road myself. I have exploited, and I, it's good to know what you can do and what you can't. I have not invented. I have taken, thanks to this curiosity, looking at the US domination of the client, looking at the fact that people, when they are in their country, there is no global citizen. There is no global consumer. There is only local consumer. And that if we think local consumer, we can bring them something which will make a big difference. One anecdote, uh, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, I want, um, I have been a little bit successful uh, at the time. I had this guy against me, uh, or Leo Burnett in Germany, with Marcos de Quinto, who is now the uh, CMO, global CMO of Coca-Cola. But um, Coca-Cola in, in uh, Russia has been extremely successful and has won a lot of market share. And in fact, pretty quickly after they plateaued, and when they plateaued, they were looking for a way of rebounding, bouncing back, and winning more market share. And the only way uh, they were looking is to spend more, which is good for the agency and not bad for the media, but not so good when uh, at the end of the day you are not getting the result that you are expecting. And uh, Sergio Zeman at that time was uh, asking me if I had a solution. I said, listen, give me six weeks. And during these six weeks, we did uh, two things. The first thing we did was to take teams that we sent in Russia for three weeks in the deep country. They went to see the Mujik where they were living. They went, they, we are not in Moscow, in uh, uh, what is St. Petersburg today, etc. This was not uh, the place where we, we went. We went in the deep country. And second thing, gathering all the information, we came with uh, a, a campaign that uh, we proposed. And this is uh, a campaign which was uh, in the deep soul of uh, the Russian people. They recognized their story, modernized, with the Koch legend. And it was a blend which has worked beautifully. And instead of being sold only in some big cities, they started to be sold in the countryside. And uh, again, it is because we have been able to uh, uh, connect with uh, the, the people. So the, we built a new legend based on an old legend which was shared by all the Russians since their uh, little age. The other thing is that uh, that curiosity is something which should uh, help you being always flexible mentally and having always the, 
your mind, your brain in alert, in red alert. I don't believe that uh, the brain sleeps. And I think that uh, when uh, you are looking at something, either you, you, have, uh, you are not seeing or you are observing. And when I'm looking, I'm observing. And every time, you look at things, you discover the behavior of the people, you discover some aspect, we change the life and we change the way in which you can advertise and you can connect with the people. It is these little small things which can flex the brain and help you. The other thing that I would like uh, to to mention is that um, you have to accept to learn. And you have to accept that somebody else has a better idea. I remember when I was running Publicis Conseil and I was uh, the CEO and I was uh, looking at the creative work, I wanted always that we have the whole team, not the creative director, the planner, and uh, the account guy. I wanted the assistant in the room. And I wanted the opinion of everyone. Because very often, first, the first thing that this does is to train the people. It's something which is a training exercise, which is excellent, because they are sitting in the room and they are seeing the senior people working, reacting, and they are the witness of a small drama, which is always how are we going to fight for an idea. When they are confident, they dare to raise their hand. And very often, you find the gem. So, I have always been struck by uh, somebody for whom I had uh, great admiration, who is, was uh, Thomas Edison, and I have never understood why he has never wanted to believe in the idea of Nikola Tesla, which was the alternate circuit which is what we have today and we had since ever. And I think that this kind of refusal to learn from somebody else, to be so uh, arrogant that you have the best idea is completely contrarian to our world. No one has a better idea than altogether. No one can lead, can have the beginning of an idea, it is always a teamwork, and uh, it is always something which is leading to uh, a, 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 great, uh, uh, a, a great solution. I have mentioned the right to fail. I will not insist. And the last thing is... Uh, uh, the issue of collaboration. Uh, we have to learn to collaborate. Now, can we be a pioneer? Can we be a pioneer in today's world? In our world, advertising, when we know that Larry Page, Sergey Brin, when we know that Alibaba and uh, Jack Ma, when we know that uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, and on and on, and all these guys who are, are real pioneers. They have an idea, and they went through that idea, and they built something extraordinary. Can we, in our field of advertising, doing something which is new, which is different? As I said, I don't believe that I am a pioneer. I have to have uh, the humility of recognizing that I'm not. Uh, and I am the one 
who in that industry are the most believed in digital world. To the point that I have maybe overspent. Future will tell <laughs> a, in that field. I don't know. But um, I, I have uh, heavily uh, invested uh, since uh, 2006 in order to transform. What led me to do that? I told you, opening the eyes and observing. When I started to think about uh, what we call at QBC the uh, Human Digital Agency, uh, which was 2006, and uh, we started to think about this in 2005. 2005, we were in the Dead Sea. We were digging deep uh, below the level of the sea simply because the bubble burst, the dot-com era was finished, and no one was investing in digital. It was finished. And if you pronounce digital, you lose immediately 20% of your market uh, capitalization. Immediately, people didn't believe any word on digital. And uh, I made the first deal, which has uh, been the Digitas. Uh, uh, I paid it one billion three. Why? I was looking at people in the street, people in the airport, the laptop on the knees, the cell phones. There was not yet smartphones. People always uh, on, connected. The blur of uh, the time at work and the time uh, uh, at so-called leisure. The fact that people were shopping online already. And I said, this will have a huge consequence in our business. It will have an enormous consequence. And that consequence is that uh, our business will be hugely impacted by digital. And that has been the uh, reason why I decided to, to do it. If we look now at the four trends which will be with very little doubt, uh, shaping the future. You have big data, that's simple. And that is something which is uh, starting. It's just starting. No one has yet the solution. Uh, can we be a pioneer in the big data? I don't know. We can create some new tools. We can create some new solutions. We can create some uh, new big things. But is it really the notion of being a pioneer? I don't believe so. But clearly, big data is something which is changing the life of uh, our clients and should change our lives as advertising people because we have to think differently. And we have to develop tools which will help us to uh, deal with the targeting in a much different way that we do. We mentioned uh, the connected world. People are connected. They are always on. You can look at uh, what's happening in the airport everywhere. They are with their mobile, their smartphone, etc. Mobility today is at the core of everything. And when you look at uh, the way investment, advertising investment on mobile communication, you see a steep change. You see that the curve is going up very radically up uh, and with huge rate of growth and connected with social. And that has been the term for Facebook. It's when Facebook made it mobile. Uh, so it is clearly this uh, connection of uh, mobility and uh, social, uh, where people are using their mobile phone a little for 
calling someone, and the most is for taking pictures, selfies, uh, writing emails, uh, SMS, etc., etc. Uh, there is the address book. There is uh, a lot of things. They are taking notes when they are in the airport, etc., etc. I don't need to tell you that. You know that, and you are using yourself this. It is almost a computer. The third aspect, which will transform our life, our business, is e-commerce. You have to know that uh, prediction is that e-commerce will represent in 2020 or 2022 one trillion euros in the world. And then it will continue. So you can imagine what this does mean, and you can understand why I have both sapient. And uh, the last thing which will shape the world is uh, uh, 2 billion new consumers who will come from uh, Africa, India, and China. And this will shape the world. These are the four big uh, things which will happen. So, if you are a pioneer, I'm not. What, what will be the key things that you should think about when you look at these four big uh, uh, things which will shape the world? What are the areas you have to think about if you want to have an impact. The first one is that uh, there is a space, a new space, <coughs> which is the space of blurring. Everything is blurring. The life of the people is blurred between, uh, uh, as I said, uh, working hours and non-working hours. Who cares? People call you at any time uh, because there is an issue. People do not think that it is Sunday or that it is uh, 11 p.m. because they are themselves on. Uh, you do not make a difference, and that's the reason why you see a lot of people when they are at the office doing uh, uh, their uh, Facebook stories, and when they are uh, at home uh, doing some, home, some homework for the office. Time is blurred. Time with the family is blurred, which is changing society, by the way. The other thing which is blurred is the role of companies. One example, but there are many. One example is Amazon. What is Amazon today? Is it um, a bookseller, a DVD seller, or just a platform for e-commerce? Okay, so we will say it's a platform for e-commerce. But they are selling advertising, so it's a media. And they are selling uh, the cloud. I didn't know that we could sell the cloud, but they are doing it. Uh, and they are getting some revenue out of the cloud. This is not something from Amazon. This is something for Microsoft or for IBM. When you look at uh, Google, what is this company today? What are they doing? Are they building the car of the future? Are they creating the uh, diagnosis of the future that you can have at home and cure your cancer before it is uh, detected? Or are they an IT company? Or are they simply a connecting tool? I don't know. They are going in so many directions. But you can take also some uh, classic companies. And you can see that uh, the blur he is almost everywhere. So the blur is something which is uh, changing completely 
the way we were thinking about companies, and this is giving space if you want to be a pioneer, because you can invent something at the intersection of a solution we were not thinking about yesterday, because we had the, a, a mindset which was uh, uh, formatted, uh, which was formed uh, with a format which was relatively simple. There are people who are doing hardware, there are people who are doing software, etc. There are retailers. Look at the retailers today. Are they retailers? Are they producers? Are they e-commerce platforms? Then there is something which is extremely interesting in our world, which is about efficiency. We are building a society of deflation, at least in our business. Everyone who has been growing in a world of expansion and the world of inflation should be lost if he is waking up today because everything that we are creating is cheaper. Media, much cheaper. A contact, much cheaper. Uh, and we see that the revenue of the agencies are declining unless if they can grow outside their normal pond. The client is looking at solutions which are much cheaper, much cheaper and uh, he is looking for uh, the uh, uh, best ROI. And there is a, a mindset with procurement, etc., which is about deflation. And this is something which is changing the economy of the world. And we should not be wrong about this because uh, we, we are creating uh, something which is uh, always uh, extremely tight and there is no room, no room for having interns, no room for hiring more people than we need, no room for having some uh, uh, extra people that we will keep just as trainees and uh, uh, we don't know if we will use them or not. But I remember a time where I was hiring every year one of those people, I had no idea what I will do with them. I said, we will train them. Today, I can't do that. Not only I can't do that, but I have to use uh, my workforce at its best. The third aspect is something uh, that you have to think about, uh, which is uh, uh, key in the future and which is in contradiction. I was speaking about the paradox. We have not finished with the paradox. Another paradox that you have the big data, so you have access to the big data, and you have a huge trend to privacy. And uh, at the same time, we want, and our clients want that we go and we communicate to individuals and we have the responsibility of respecting the privacy of everyone. And this is something uh, that uh, has to lead us to think differently on how we can respect the privacy and at the same time finding the solution to target the right people. We have found a way, but it is uh, uh, not yet perfect, and I'm not sure that it will be perfect one day, which is uh, to create avatars and to see a group of people who are resembling at an avatar, and uh, then we are addressing the avatar, we are addressing the group of people, etc., etc. The last thing is uh, speed. If uh, you, you think about something today and you want to make it happen, you have to move fast. Uh, think uh, how much time it took uh, to Mark Zuckerberg to create Facebook. Uh, how much time it took uh, to create Twitter. Fast. 
It's no longer building a factory, uh, creating a new a building, etc., uh, machinery. No, no, it's the brain. It's something which moves fast. And if you don't move fast, your idea is kept by somebody else or took by somebody else or invented by somebody else. The last thing I would like uh, to mention on this is that if you are a company which already exists, all these elements, if you don't look at them and you don't take the right decision pretty quickly, you are almost dead. Think about some companies which, if I'm giving names, maybe this will remind you something. Polaroid, Kodak, Newsweek, the FT Deutschland, here, what was Universal Music, and even HP, who is now rebuilding the company. So being a pioneer is also being capable of taking your old company to the new level and not uh, forgetting that the world is changing around yourselves. What have we done, we at Publicis, and maybe we'll have time for a few questions. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, to take into account all these changes and to make sure that we can deal with them, we have thought that uh, we, we have uh, to change our model. And because of uh, m my engineer background, uh, I thought about the formula where we have uh, IQ plus EQ plus TQ multiply factor by BQ. IQ, everyone can understand. It's an uh, intellectual quotient. It's about strategy, how you think about strategy. You think about the product. You position the product. You position the brand. You decide uh, intellectually uh, what should be the game for the client to win. EQ, uh, emotional quotient. That is something which is also fairly simple. Uh, if you want to connect with uh, these uh, guys who are called uh, human beings, uh, uh, you, these uh, analog people, you have to find the way. And the way is clearly with the emotion. You will never build something only on rational. You can say a lot of time is cheaper, that's fine, they will benefit of the promotion, but they will not build the relationship. The relationship is built out of emotion. And you have to create that emotional link. TQ, simple, it's technology quotient. We have to master technology. And all this, you have to do it bloody quick. <laughs> Therefore, the BQ because it's time of speed. Um, if you expect from me that I will give you the recipe of being a pioneer, as I said, I'm not a pioneer. I cannot give you the, how to become a pioneer. The only thing is if you believe in something, if you truly believe that you have an idea, if you truly believe that you can do something different, you do it. Just do it, as Nike said it. You fail. So what? Your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend will say, ah, terrible. <laughs> OK, for a while. After, you will rebounce back, and the thing will work, and uh, you will bring new ideas, a new initiative, and uh, everything will be fine. But uh, the only thing that you should not accept is the dull life. If there is something you should never accept, is to have a life of a bureaucrat. If you like to be a bureaucrat, 
you work in an insurance company or you become a, a civil servant, a functionary. But if you want to be a, in the world of uh, emotion, of uh, intellectual power, uh, where uh, there is the intersection of uh, uh, technology, marketing, communication, uh, and the power of uh, creativity, you can't accept to be dull, and you can't accept a dull life. I think it was not a dull hour. Huh? So. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. So, in relation to the digital and uh, the, your recent investments, um, <coughs> sorry, your recent acquisitions, do you see, what do you say, you talked about the blur and the space, uh, so I was interesting, interested in hearing from you about the business model innovation opportunities that you see in the advertising space. This is something which is uh, keeping me really awake at night. Uh, if I'm serious about this, uh, there is uh, so many uh, difficulties that our industry is facing. It's not easy today for everyone, our competitors as well as ourselves. Or look, in the past you had many middle-sized agencies which were independent. Where are they today? Uh, either they uh, are capable of uh, uh, growing and they are both, or they fail and they disappear. I think that we need to help our client in the digital transformation and we have to move up in the food chain. And uh, today we are at, uh, we are giving away, I don't know if there is many people from the advertising agencies in the room, but we are giving away a lot of what people are selling at a very high price. We are almost giving away uh, our intellectual uh, offer capabilities. Uh, when we do planning and strategy, we are selling this by the hour, which is stupid. Uh, the creative uh, work is uh, uh, sold also on hourly fees. And um, we are just uh, limited in the field of communication, where, in fact, What's happening today is that uh, our clients are facing uh, a, a, a lot of challenges for their digital transformation. And we have to learn how we can help them facing that digital transformation. And they believe that we are the best place to do that. It is complex, it is difficult. Uh, and. Um, Part of the reason why I was interested in Sapient, it's because they have uh, three arms. One, which is not the most interesting one, uh, which is government services. One, which is what they call global market, which is in fact consulting and technology. And this is fantastic, because it is helping the client to transform themselves. And the other one is Sapient Nitro, which is like a reserve fish or Digitas, Digitas LBI. So we, with this uh, second arm, which is the global market, which is consulting and uh, technology, we can help them transform themselves. And we can take maximum advantage of what uh, uh, they can uh, create, and we can be part of this uh, co-creation. So I, I, when you look at uh, our business, sorry to be a little bit long, but it's uh, important. You see that uh, Accenture is coming in our field. You see that McKinsey is coming in our field. BCG is coming in our field. Why should we s stay still and not go in their field? And this is what I have tried to do by acquiring Sapient, is to say, okay, I'm, I'm not letting them come in uh, and uh, I, they have to defend their business as I have to defend mine. And as we are bringing, we, the creative agencies, 
something which is unique, which is this bond, which is this emotional bond, this is something which we can leverage to a degree that we never had before. Maurice, how do you see the agency and your agency, but also your competitors, collaborating to innovate with some of the technology companies uh, that you mentioned earlier? We, uh, we do it already. Uh, we signed the very first agreement with uh, Google in 2008. And in 2008, we agreed that uh, we will help Google understanding the consumers, understanding the brand, and they will help us understanding the technology and the world of Internet. We still have 10, 15 people of Google in our offices in Boston. They have developed uh, what we call AOD, which is Audience and Demand, which is our tool. Uh, for programmatic, which we launched uh, in 2008. And we are collaborating with uh, Facebook, and we have been uh, instrumental on the video for Facebook. We are collaborating with Twitter, and we are helping them, and they are helping us. So we, we ha I don't believe, that, that is a very important question, I don't believe in tomorrow's world that one company, whatever it is, in whatever field, can do the whole thing by itself. In the good old days, you had uh, uh, the car manufacturer were doing the same. They, they were transforming uh, the, the steel. They were uh, uh, building the engine. They were doing the brakes. They were doing almost every single thing. Uh, the seats were developed by the manufacturers. Today, they develop a few pieces which are making the difference, and all the rest is assembled. You have Bosch, Valeo, who are developing a lot of organs. It's no longer Renault, Mercedes, or BMW who are developing these organs. And uh, they are collaborating, and they try to have the best partners which is, by the way, one of the chances that we have. They have to embark us as one of their best partners. One day I said to one of my clients, you can put us in your balance sheet because you have the best team working for you. And you should not treat us by fees, but treat us as an asset. And I believe that uh, collaboration is indispensable. Even General Electric cannot do everything itself. So why should we be able to do that? So we have to collaborate with them. We have to collaborate with the media. We have to collaborate with the startups. And one of the things that I'm very keen on is uh, to invest in the startups. We have two tools at Publicis. One is uh, something which is held by uh, uh, Richard Tobacowala, who is our chief strategist and it is called Publicis Ventures, and we give seed money, and we help and advise, and we support. Um, today we have roughly uh, 45 uh, uh, companies that we are supporting, and we have put money at a company called, uh, a, a private equity called uh, Iris Capital, uh, with uh, Orange, we have put each one 75 million euros, and we are helping uh, startups. Uh, we have early stage and we have growth, uh, so we don't try raise. There is no seed money, and uh, we learn from them. We learn from uh, the energy, the talent, the ideas that they have. Maybe the last one? Last one? I have a last one. Hmm. Uh, there is someone who had the last one, and you will have uh, the last last. And maybe this isn't the best question for last, but I remember you invested in Facebook very early. Was that your most successful, or was there something else that was a more successful investment? <laughs> I, I'm always thinking that uh, 
the most successful thing that uh, will happen is yet to happen. I have uh, still 20-something uh, months to go before my retirement. And uh, I think that um, there is still two or three things that I would like to do which will be more successful than what I have ever done. Sounds good. By some publicist, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but they are back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Not the last question, the closing question. You know, I mean, we are, we are very happy of what we've built here with the Berlin School. I wonder how you go about leadership education in publicis and how you finance it. Do you have a budget for it? Where does the budget come from? This is, is a fundraising question. Budget? <laughs> this is a fundraising question. <laughs> huh? Yeah, take it yeah. like that. Not fundraising, we want to have yeah, more no, participants will, okay, from okay. publicis. Okay, I will, uh, we have a program at Publicis, we have many programs. And this is something that we are revisiting today because we have far too many programs. Sachi has his own, Leo Burnett has his own, Publicis his own, et cetera, et cetera. Everyone wants uh, Viva la Différence. So they are quoting me in my own game. I say, you say Viva la Différence? Ah, we are different. So we want each one our own uh, different program. There are some areas where it is very important to have the different, a different program because uh, it is about culture. But there are a lot of areas where we, we don't need different programs. At the group level, we have one program which is called the Executive Development Program, EDP, which is international, which is uh, uh, four times a year, one in Europe with INSEAD, uh, one in the U.S. with Wharton, one in Latin America with also in SEAD, and one in uh, APAC with also in SEAD. And uh, what we are doing is something which is uh, fairly simple. It's during uh, four days, uh, people are working together, receiving lectures from clients, from professors, and uh, from uh, 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 executive from the group. Little. This part is uh, less than 10% of the program because we don't want that it is uh, just a kind of internship. And the last day, they have to present the result of their work. They have to learn to work in uh, teams, uh, and uh, they are rewarded. Uh, so it's uh, a group uh, of 40 to 50 people. We are having uh, uh, one on top of what we do in pure Mandarin, in Shanghai, and it is, I believe, next week. Uh, otherwise, they are all in English. Um, the result, uh, it's, uh, uh, there are many aspects in the result. The first one, they, they have built a community of uh, alumni, and it's very good. The second is that uh, there is a continuous improvement program with uh, Every single program we are trying to uh, move uh, to the next level. And we are asking the people to rate what was good, what was less good. And uh, to finish with, uh, uh, we, we are, uh, it is a step where people are prepared for new responsibilities. So it's something also which is viewed as being uh, very positive. A creative executive part of that? Or is it more accountable? They are, but little. They are, they, but they don't feel good. <laughs> How do you feel? Good? good? Hey, raise your hand if you feel good. 
as a great person. There is person. a question from the lady. Okay. We have been doing uh, for years something with clients that currently we are doing a program with Nestle where we are hiring together uh, students, beginners, and they have to spend at least six months at Publicis, six months at Nestle, and then we decide who will be hiring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And they decide where they have to go. We have done that program. The first time I did it was in the 70s. I did it with uh, uh, Renault. And uh, it was terrible because uh, Renault wanted always all the promotion. And they were the client. So I was training the people for Renault. But at the end of the day, I thought that this was good. And it has helped raise the bar of our creative product. So you are right. We should include the clients. Yeah. And what we do is uh, clearly insufficient. But we have that program with also L'Oréal. <coughs> it's more difficult with American clients. <laughs> no, it's a, no, no. It's uh, simply because of their practice and their rules. Uh, th there is less flexibility than with the European client. Uh, European, oh, it's also difficult with the German client. <laughs> <laughs> Maurice, hey, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a million. We hope to have you back. We are very honored that you come. Thank you. Thank you.